Hey guys, so I got to interview one of my heroes, a guy called Max Deutsch, who's done some incredible things and he's a really big inspiration for me and the reason I started this channel. So in this uh, video, we speak about the art of learning, we go through his story, some of the amazing things that he's done and some of the best learning lessons he's gotten from all of that. So this is one of the best pieces of content that I've put out and I hope you guys really enjoy it. Right after graduating college, I had this mindset, right, which was I'm going to spend the next few years, become wildly successful, and then once I reach this magical point of success, then I could finally live my ideal life, whatever that means, right? And for me, that was had a, a huge component of learning, that had a big component of writing, that had a big component of building, uh, specifically in the education space. So I knew there was these set of things that I wanted to do. But upon graduating, my mindset was, I can't do those things until I've proven myself or until I've sold a business or I'm retired, right? Like I, I had imagined that the first step was to pursue some sort of ambiguous success. And then only then would I have this platform to, to do some of these other things, right? So I started off at Intuit um, as a product manager, entry level, worked really hard. Within nine months of working there, uh, my work was recognized. And I was asked to shift focus and start working one-on-one -on -one with Intuit's founder, Scott Cook, on company-wide strategy. Amazing. So that was a huge, that was a huge opportunity, right? Despite that, though, right, so my, my hope was, like, maybe I could, you know, start my success or, like, achieve step one of this two-part mission, right, at Intuit. I'm now working on strategy for the entire $50 billion company, and yet there's this – there's still this underlying angst that I'm no closer to reaching that step two or that goal of living my ideal life. It's like, okay, I've made a lot of progress in the past less than a year. And still my life doesn't seem like it's getting closer to where I'm trying to get it to. And so in parallel to Intuit, again, in pursuit of this like success to facilitate this other stuff, I started a software company or a software development agency called Rock. Um, that did that built for clients, right? And so we shipped a dozen apps in the first two years, I would say, so simultaneously to working at Intuit. And those apps were covered in TechCrunch and Wall Street Journal and Wired Magazine and had tens of thousands of users and paying customers. And eventually I was, you know, I started making more money at Rhombus than, than I was simultaneously at Intuit. So everything that I sort of hoped to achieve with Rhombus actualized but yeah, that's that same angst, that same feeling like, OK, that's great. Like I'm continuing to make forward progress, but I was being very reactive to the opportunities that were coming up and just not being as intentional about the things that I actually wanted to do. I was deferring them for some magical moment that never came. And then a year into my time at Intuit, as part of my annual review, I went on a walk with my manager and she knew about all the things I was doing inside of work and outside of work. And she asked me, OK, I think what you're doing is really cool and interesting and diverse. But what's the point? Like, what is it all for? What are you actually trying to accomplish? Um, and the way I heard that was like, what is your ideal life? Like, you're doing all this stuff, but what would you like to be doing? And it was the first time since I had graduated that I asked myself this question. And by the time I got back to my desk from that walk, I decided I'm going to forget about trying to pursue this ambiguous success. And I'm just going to try to build my life around those few activities that I've already deemed most fulfilling um, and most meaningful. And so that was October 2016. And on November 1st, 2016, I began a year long project called Month to Master to make those three things materialize. So the Month to Master project, the basic premise was that I would challenge myself to master one expert level skill every month for the next 12 months. And I would blog about my process and my progress on a daily basis with the hope that I would have this clear structure to learn every single day, whether that was a new language or an instrument, et cetera. I would have something to write about every day. And then if I immersed myself in the learning process in this way, eventually I would come across some sort of insight that would become the basis for a company in the education space. So that's, that's amazing. So I obviously found you through your um, Month to Master challenges and I was really inspired by it, obviously, because here I am um, about to do my 12th challenge, actually. Oh, wow. I appreciate it. And that's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I read it and, and you know, I, I'm similar. I, I think about what is my ideal life and how do I move towards that? And, and an ideal life doesn't necessarily, um, 
it's not necessarily built around uh, the societal normal, normal success uh, metrics, but it's something for you to try to figure out. So there's a lot that I wanted to unpack there, but maybe starting off um, with, you spoke about your ideal life and you spoke about that it's around education and learning, but how did you come to realize what your ideal life is? And yeah, how did you get clarity around that? Yeah, so I would say during college and high school and before that, I was very much of an explorer and, and thinking about these kinds of things. So that same curiosity encouraged me to find the things that I found most interesting and fulfilling and anything you can name, you know, I experimented with it, I tried it. And because of that, and just being thoughtful and, and testing things out and not trying to optimize for the way that I was being perceived or traditional success, you know, like up until the point of graduation, I was really able to carve out the, the, the things that I really liked. And the truth is, those few things that I just mentioned, those have seeds or roots back to my childhood. So the gift that I would always ask for, like from age six to, you know, through high school was an empty sketchbook or journal. And what I would do is like as a really little kid, I would just write like full chapter books in those journals. And so in my bedroom in my parents' house still, there's like a stack of these picture books or chapter books that I just hand wrote. And so I loved, I always loved storytelling. I always loved the creative expression of writing. If I saw someone doing something that I couldn't do, my reaction wasn't, oh, I must be, they must be the kind of person that could do that. And I'm not, it was, oh, if they can do that, then that must be an op option for me since we're both human beings. Let me see if I can also do that. And so that was sort of always the mindset. And the short answer to your question is you don't really know until you try stuff. And so I happened to have tried things that I found to to be really awesome. Yeah, awesome. And so with the Monster Master, um, you know, super cool project, obviously, I was heavily inspired by it. I think a lot of people were. Can you talk me through some of the challenges that stand out? And now what has it been maybe a year or so since uh, that project finished? Yeah. But, um, yeah, some of the kind of the most influential or interesting things that you maybe stood out the most throughout that, pro that uh, process. Yeah, so why don't I, I'll, I'll list through I'll just give you the one sentence for each of the 12 months, and Let's then I'll it. highlight a few of the interesting ones. Please. So the first month was perhaps a little bit more obscure, but it was the challenge was to memorize the order of a shuffled pack of playing cards in under two minutes, which is the threshold to be considered a grandmaster of memory. Yeah. You know, I finished that challenge memorizing the deck in a minute 47. So that was a great way of, of starting off. And then the next month, I learned to draw realistic portraits. So that was December. January, I solved the I did Rubik's that same Cube. challenge with the same course, by the way. The yeah, it's a art. terrific, yeah, amazing terrific course. course. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was blown away by how good both of us got, you know, from, you know, I was quite surprised even in myself to be like, whoa, I drew this, you know, like, yeah. I don't know how you felt about it, but for me, I would say if I didn't practice drawing for the next 20 years and then I came back and sat down and I printed out just the cheat sheet I made of the steps that I needed to do, I would be able to completely replicate my result. Like I didn't feel like I developed any new skills. I just saw the drawing process from a new way. Yep. And just by following that process, I went from my, you know, before, which was like somewhat recognizable to my after, which was very clearly uh, recognizable. I feel exactly the same way. And I say that to people and they're like, nah, you, you obviously have natural talent. You're, you're artistic or whatever. And it's like, no, there's just a process that works. But, you know, until you do it, I can totally understand why people would be skeptical. But yeah, really cool. Honestly, that challenge is a great entry point for anyone that wants to give something like this a go because I think the course is, is really great. So, I'm you know, they could find your video and you probably talk about the course there. Yeah. I think it's a really sort of systematic. You don't have to come up with your own approach. Like the approach is there. It's very systematic. And you, the, the, res the difference in the result for I, I think pretty much anyone is going to be very striking. So it can inspire some confidence to, to keep trying other totally. things. Totally. Totally. So yeah. that was December, and then January, I solved a Rubik's Cube in 17 seconds. Yeah, um, that's crazy. These first few challenges were less about pioneering my own method. It was like, here are things that have clear methodologies, and sort of the, the warm-up activities were, can I just have this consistency and deliberate practice regimen where I can make progress along those, right? So those were the first three. The next one was perhaps one of my favorites, if not my favorite, um, and that was landing a standing backflip. Yeah, nice. It required way fewer hours than the rest of them. I think I spent like four and a half hours in the gym over the month, but just because of the 
fear and the chemicals in my brain and just feeling so wildly out of my comfort zone that that challenge, every time I left the gym, I just felt really good. I've done a backflip challenge too. And for me, I ended up putting a lot more than t than four and a half hours because it, I feel like it's so much about the confidence. I saw that um, you also had those pulleys, um, uh, yeah. that kind of harness, which was pretty cool. But my progression was into a pit and then onto uh, a not very bouncy trampoline and then onto just kind of a softer mat. And that next progression yeah. mentally was so challenging, so challenging. I think a lot of people with that baseline um, physical uh, capacity could, could pick it up pretty quick. Well, that's true, which is I walked into the gym and I think it's probably the same for you, physically capable of doing a backflip. And I think for most reasonably fit 20 something, 30 somethings, I think physic from a physical fitness standpoint, you can do a backflip. You can jump high enough. You can tuck your knees hard enough. It's just the self-preservation yeah. mental battle. Um, and that takes time. And uh, it was really hard for me too. Have you um, so done a backflip since? I haven't. Um, <laughs> so I think at this point, it's been a year and a half since that challenge. So I think at this point, if I went back to the gym, I would have to go through the progressions again. It might be a little bit more expedited because expedited I have the confidence. I could watch the video and, and see myself doing it. But the fear is is definitely creeping back in. Just thinking about it right now. Yeah. So that was the fourth month. The fifth month, I played a five-minute improvisational blues guitar solo. So this was the first month I was treading into more subjective territory, right? Like the first four is pretty clear. With the guitar solo, who's to say if this was good or bad? That was also a, a really fun challenge because I've been noodling on the guitar for years now. And this is actually true with the Rubik's Cube too. So I didn't start the Rubik's Cube completely from scratch. I knew how to solve it and I was slow, but I could solve it. Um, but had noodling, had been noodling with it for, you know, 10 years just as a, a fun thing. So it's interesting to see with both the guitar and the Rubik's Cube how in 10 years, I pretty much just maintained my level of confidence. And then with actual intention of getting better within a, a couple weeks, how much how much better I was actually able to get. Yeah, I mean, I've had the same thing. So um, juggling, I could juggle with three and I've, I've always loved juggling. And then in a month I went up to five and oh, wow. that's a huge jump. Um, yeah. I mean, for me, four was just crazy hard and I never even, like I tried it over the years, never did it. And then to be able yeah. to do, it's not like I got fully comfortable at five, but I could get 10 catches yeah, and it was just that focus and thinking about different technique and really breaking down some of those finer points to get to that next level, yeah. That's actually a really interesting point for a lot of people where there's a lot of hobbies that we do, like play the guitar or um, you know skateboarding or basketball, and you just play it and you want to improve, but you're not really thinking about um, the process that you're, you're using to actually, from what does uh, Anna Erickson say from like Peak? It's like deliberate practice. Um, right. getting feedback and stuff like that so that a lot of the activities that you could do or that you currently do you could improve a lot faster if you did want to bring that focus to those activities for sure i think the sort of prototypical example is is golfing right where you could go out you could play 18 holes every weekend and you know after that first little learning curve you pretty much you know spend the rest many decades of your life just staying at whatever handicap you are um, and, and the difference is, you know, there's a difference between practicing to get better and going out for sort of a recreational game, right? And yeah. they, both those activities look very different. And so obviously it depends on what you want and your goals, but just doing the activity over and over doesn't necessarily imply that you're going to get better. Yeah, 100%. So the next challenge was the second scariest challenge of the year. Um, but in a different way. And the, the challenge was to hold a 30 minute conversation in a foreign language. Yeah. So you're about to do your Spanish challenge. So I'm interested to hear and see how that goes. But in high school, I took a few years of Spanish. And although I was very competent at reading and writing, I was essentially mute. I was so self-aware of the grammar and just knowing that the sentences I was putting together was just not exactly right, that I just didn't have the confidence to get through that filter and say anything. So that was something I really wanted to overcome with this challenge, which was forget about the reading and writing. That is a little bit more of an academic exercise, which I'm naturally better at. For me, the speaking has always been really hard in a foreign language and I wanted to break through 
So at the end of that month, when I was able to just sit down and I think the conversation ended up being like 35 minutes, we spoke about the future of technology in Hebrew the entire time. And just having the confidence to express any idea I had or close to any idea, um, that felt really good. And that, that was definitely one of the biggest wins, I would say, of the entire project. That's amazing. From my perspective, it's like, no, a month is a really long period of time. When's the last time that you spent an hour every single day deliberately and intensely focusing on learning one thing?